stealth technology, the internet, GPS in the palm of your hand, autonomous operation. Technology is a driver of our times. Since its founding in 1958 in the midst of the Cold War, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, has been a driver of technology. Welcome to Voices from DARPA, a window onto DARPA's core of program managers. Their job? To redefine what is possible. My name is Dan Green. Since 2013, I've been a program manager in DARPA's Microsystems Technology Office. And I'm your DARPA host, Ivan Amato. Dan, t tell me a little bit about your background and how it relates to what you hope to accomplish in your time here at DARPA. I came here through a series of fortunate events. I got into science from an early age. I liked physics. I did physics in college. I uh, got into semiconductor physics. So semiconductors are the materials that underpin the electronics in all of our commercial technologies today. And really fell in love with that area. At that point in time, which was in the, in the 90s, when I started getting into electronics and, and going off to grad school, it was kind of a, a bad time to be doing electronics because there was a lot of maturity and a lot of uh, concern about where it was going to go from there because of you know, the established players like Intel were, were hitting, their, hitting their stride. And along came a new material system called gallium nitride. And so I was part of this first wave of engineers that were brought up looking at gallium nitride and understanding its properties as it applies to transistor technology. Can you just spend a few seconds talking to us about what is interesting about different kinds of semiconductors? So when you look at the history of semiconductors, right, the transistors came out from Bell Labs, of course, uh, after, the, after the Second World War. So it's been around for a long time. I think the interesting piece is that uh, as dominant as silicon is today, that was not at all obvious when they started. And in fact, when you look at the, the first transistors, they were made of germanium. And they looked like crazy little contraptions. You're correct. Right? They it were was, big. They were the size of a palm almost. Essentially, they, they jabbed a couple of wires into this block of material and were able to extrapolate from that very, very rudimentary experiment that, hey, we're really onto something here. It's, it's obviously translated to many billions of dollars of, of uh, commercial activity now. And the complexity with which we can do things today is... Um, astonishing. Really the key was going from germanium to silicon and, and a lot of the technical reasons that made silicon work uh, relate to the fact that it's just it forms combinations with other materials called oxides very easily. And so having that oxide layer uh, really helped control where the electrons flow. The ability to manipulate the, the material structure is really what separated silicon from the other competitors at that time. And the interesting piece that happened with the, you know, the semiconductor zoo in the 80s and 90s was the dramatic expansion of the materials that we're able to manipulate in that manner. And so we went from things like silicon to what are known as compound semiconductors, where we use combinations of elements to create new material sets. So the, the first material set that hit the mainstream is called gallium arsenide. Instead of being a you know, regular crystal just made of silicon atoms, it has an alternating pattern of gallium and arsenic atoms. Right. And my understanding is going from silicon to a compound semiconductor like uh, gallium arsenide was hard enough that it became uh, a program at DARPA to, to try to mature that material and make it useful. Is that Absolutely part of the right. DARPA made an early investment to take what then was uh, experimental technology of gallium arsenide that was useful for things like amplifiers and really scale it up to make it manufacturable because they realized that it was going to enable us to do things like arrays, phased arrays. So what is a, a phased array? A phased array is, a, is a, a combination of amplifiers in a repeated pattern so that you can project electromagnetic waves. So that means things like radars that go on our, our planes and our ships can leverage that capability to see what's around them and to communicate. And what ended up happening was because of the, the defense interest in maturing that technology and the, and the ability to bring it to a manufacturable state, a lot of people realized that, hey, it would be useful for the commercial sector as well. And so that same gallium arsenide technology that came out of the early DARPA so-called MIMIC program in the 90s uh, was really what set off the cell phone revolution because it enabled the amplifiers that let those small handsets that you carry around with you to talk to the cell phone towers. 
and that expansion of, of the semiconductor zoo, we, we, we started with germanium, we talked about silicon, we've talked about gallium arsenide. This might be a good time to, to sort of move into some of the programs that you've been overseeing. Absolutely. Gallium arsenide was, was really exceptional because it showed how different material properties can be by moving away from just silicon. But by no means did that exhaust the periodic table. And so as people were looking around, they realized that uh, there's a lot of other options. Uh, late 90s and early 2000s was um, an individual researcher actually developed the technology to grow high quality gallium nitride material. And gallium nitride material is, is special because it, uh, it offers a wider band gap, so that's a characteristic energy of the material, and it enabled devices to be made which could emit into the blue part of the, the electromagnetic spectrum, which was not available before. That set off a whole wave in terms of lighting, and so we're seeing that today with our pixelated stoplights and, and the LEDs that we see now in our houses. But the corollary to that was it enabled that material set uh, to be more widely uh, available, and it enabled those of us in the electronics domain to use it for other purposes, like high power amplifiers that enable us to, to look at things like more efficient cell phone towers, uh, but also higher power uh, arrays for the Navy and the, and the Army and the Air Force for the sensors and the communications and the uh, electronic warfare equipment that we use every day. Right, and I know that one of your own passions has been to try to look at the strengths of these different kinds of semiconductor materials and, and then try to put them together, to mix and match them in Correct. ways that might not have been so easy to do before, partly because their crystal structures are a little different and they might not stick together well. So, mm -hmm. so these are some of the challenges, right, that you've been taking on as a program manager? Part of the interesting piece uh, with gallium nitride is not so much that it, it provides all these advantages, but that it works at all. Uh, it's a very different material set than historical semiconductors. So it has a mechanical element that's a part of the way that it operates more than just the way that it moves electronics around. It has what's known as piezoelectrics. And so it actually depends upon being compressed by the combination of materials uh, in a certain state to enable the electrons to exist where we can use them. So we can mix in a little aluminum with our gallium and nitrogen to create a different alloy and we can grow those crystals right on top of each other so that they maintain their structure from layer to layer. And a lot of the development that happened in the earlier DARPA MIMIC program was enabling those techniques where we can control that crystal layering at the atomic scale, which enables us to create these types of very finely characterized and structured devices uh, over very large areas, so we can create very complex circuits that are, are structured at that atomic scale. So where all this goes from here, because it has this funny characteristic of mechanical and electrical coupling that's different, is that there's a, a whole swath of degrees of freedom that haven't really been explored yet with gallium nitride. So I entered the field just as it was maturing and worked at a, a company to help bring one of the initial products uh, to life in terms of a high power amplifier for the cell phone community. Uh, but my time at DARPA has really been about where do we go from here in terms of leveraging all of these hidden attributes of gallium nitride that really haven't been brought to bear yet. So things like scaling the gate lengths down to the lengths that we do. And what that, that enables us to do is push up higher and higher frequencies. So how do we understand that? Well, the, the frequencies that we, we commonly encounter for like our cell phone is around 2 gigahertz. And really, because the scaling advantages and the, what we can do with gallium nitride, the higher power densities that we can, we can start to realize the ability to transmit power up in the millimeter wave. So that's up towards 30 to 300 gigahertz. And so the ability to address that higher frequency range really opens up a whole part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we haven't been able to access before. Why do we want to go there? Um, because that will enable things like 5G in the commercial sector. There's a lot of activity right now that's going to help us all stream video from wherever we want. Uh, but it also enables us to do different things like look at different material properties uh, as we interrogate what's going on with, with different materials with this different part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we can s actually literally see the world in a different way because we're using light at different wavelengths. The, the possibilities of what we can do there are just starting to be explored. And the capabilities that we're developing with gallium nitride are a building block and a tool to help us get there. Dan, how would you imagine uh, the technologies uh, that, that you're nurturing? You're spoke, speaking a lot about gallium nitride here, but how would you imagine that finding traction uh, both in national security and civilian settings? 
so the technologies we're developing with gallium nitride are, are going to be very are going to be very important for national security because it, it does enable us to get into these new parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. So that underpins all of our capabilities when it comes to things like communications or sensing. Coming from the civilian sector, I didn't really understand until I worked with uh, some of the military. Is that we, we think why do you need to sense things? And you know we know what's down the block when we're walking down the street. But if you're in the Navy and you're on the ship in the middle of the Pacific, you're in a very, very dark place and you don't know what's around you in the world. And so sensing becomes very important because you're, you're really out in the middle of nowhere. And, and that's part of the, the piece that's missing, I think, when we think about this in the context of our everyday lives, that the military is doing things that are very different from what we do in the commercial sector. What we're doing with gallium nitride is enabling the technologies that will help them with those particular missions and what will happen at the end of the day is that once we have them, I think people are creative and they will find ways to use those pieces that are more relevant to what we do in, in our everyday lives. So what might be some of the larger societal, technological, and security contexts in which your program and interests reside? It's a very interesting time right now in electronics and because historically the U.S. has had such a dominant position in the development of these technologies. You know, from the initial development of the transistor at Bell Labs, through the, you know, the, the mass rollout of PCs from Intel. And what we've seen just in the last decade or so is the globalization of that technology that spread around the world. One of the byproducts of the early going where DARPA funded a lot of these gallium arsenide technologies that rolled into our defense, uh, defense communications and, and sensing technologies was that we had a very comfortable place in the world where we could make all those components at home and use them in, in very controlled matters for our purposes. And with this globalization that's taking place because of the advent of cell phones and mass consumer electronics, we're, we're seeing now that all of these electronic pieces and these different developments are happening all over the world. And so it really challenges us in the way that we consume electronics in, in the Department of Defense uh, because now we, we don't necessarily have all of those best components at home because there's a lot of activity all over the world. And so there's, there's challenges both to understand what pieces uh, we should develop and can continue to own at home and what pieces we should leverage in that global marketplace and how to put the, the best of those products together so that we can, can remain competitive. What you're talking about here in some ways is the sort of the technology ecosystem, the engineering ecosystem, the innovation ecosystem that makes me think about where DARPA fits into these various ecosystems. So DARPA really is, is fantastic in that it has the ability to go in and make significant investments to advance technologies that are, that are going to be critical and, and can really be a difference maker. For instance, in, in gallium nitride, and, you know, I mentioned the, the importance of GAN as it came along to advancing what we can do in the RF spectrum. And really that technology was, was out in the world because of the LED marketplace. But DARPA came along and made a significant investment in wideband gap semiconductors, of which gallium nitride is one, to push the maturity of that, uh, that space for the electronics domain. And because of that early investment, DARPA uh, has created capabilities that are being rolled out now to the services in, in the form of new radars that are going to the Navy and communication systems that are going around the services. And it's also dominant in provided the backbone for industry players that are serving the commercial market as well. Dan, can you uh, describe uh, one science fiction technology, either that you've read about in the past, you've come up on your own, you've woken up in the middle of the night with this dream of a technology uh, that doesn't exist now, but that you really wish could exist? <laughs> this is what we do here, is spend our time dreaming about different technologies. So. It's such a fascinating time because a lot of these things that we formerly just dreamed about are coming to life around us. The, the one comic book I, I did read when I was a kid was Iron Man, and so we now have all these Iron Man movies. But what's fascinating is walking around the building and seeing how parts of those technologies are starting to make it look less and less crazy. You're, you're starting to see people who are actually working on exosuits, uh, people who are working on how we connect the body to electronics, how we actually interface with electronics. So you're talking here about complex and potentially powerful technologies, which means they could lead to both good and perhaps troublesome results. How do you think about the potential consequences of the technologies you're helping to develop? So I think 
that's a it's an interesting question that we do struggle with a lot as we continue to expand our capability to compute and project into the electromagnetic spectrum it really raises the ability for us to to be always on and and always connected and it not only does that you know raise all the issues that we're seeing today in terms of having your cell phone on all the time and, and being in that sense always on but also this uh always aware so that there's no way to hide things. And so it becomes a very open and transparent place to be, which has pluses and minuses in terms of how we operate as a democracy in the world. Uh, So I I think there's a lot of implications of technology that are yet to be grappled with. But it's also a a law of physics that technology will advance. Uh, We will continue to explore the world. So it doesn't help us to not try to advance and see what's, what's possible. The whole point of DARPA is to prevent surprise. And really part of our job here is to go out and figure out what's possible so that we can start that process of understanding it early. Well, Dan, I've really enjoyed our conversation here today. Thank you, Evan. Thanks for listening and tune in next time to hear another voice from DARPA. For more information about DARPA, the program managers, and the breakthrough technologies they are developing, visit us online at DARPA.mil.